Welcome to the IUN Community Garden Presentation, Getting Started Gardening. My name is Leslie Kaiser. I'm a garden coordinator. I'll be serving as a moderator. Rebecca Cates is our presenter. Rebecca is the Lake County Urban Agriculture Extension Educator through Purdue Extension. She works out of the Crown Point office. Rebecca graduated from Purdue University with degrees in wildlife and forestry and natural resources. She enjoys growing vegetables and food for pollinators in her own garden. Rebecca also enjoys helping people grow their own food and enjoys the outdoors. She can be reached at busser at purdue.edu. Rebecca, welcome. So thank you all for being here to talk about getting started gardening outdoors. Um, so today we're focusing on gardening outdoors, but uh, later next month we'll have a presentation on gardening indoors and other alternative methods. So definitely tune in again for that. Uh, just as a reminder, Purdue does promote equal opportunity and access to all our programming. What we're going to talk about today are basic garden needs and considerations, different outdoor gardening methods and techniques, uh, decisions that you can make re related to seed and starter plant selection, mapping and planning your garden and garden calendar, companion planting and preparing your garden soil for growing. So first we have to talk about your garden location. Um, your ideal garden location is going to have full sun for at least six hours a day. So you're going to want to avoid things like trees, shrubs, or being up against buildings that are going to provide uh, more shade than you're, than you're wanting. And if you're growing in the ground, you're going to want to avoid things like trees and shrubs for their roots. Um, and especially if it's a black walnut tree, if you're growing in the ground, you're going to want to avoid black walnuts because they do carry, um, they do produce tannins that can that are toxic to other plants and the plant growth. You're going to want to choose a site that has well drained soil uh, and ideally not low lying or flood zone area. So it's good to be able to observe your grow site over the course of a year just so that you can make those observations and make a decision if this is the garden location for you. Um, ideally, you also want to be close to a source of water because rainwater alone, unless you have a rainwater catchment uh, device such as rain barrels, is not going to be enough. So making sure that you can reach water for your garden. Next, when you're thinking about planning your garden, uh, there are different ways that you can do this. You can uh, plan your garden out on paper or use an online device like growveg.com. I actually just use my notes section in my phone, so you can be as high tech or low tech as you'd like. Um, you can plan for a multi-year plan for gardening, especially if you're rotating your crops. Um, you can plan based on plant spacing, plan your garden for diversity, uh, and also consider things like companions or pairings for plantings, which we'll talk a little bit more about here. Uh, I mentioned that you might be interested in rotating your crops, especially if you're doing a multi-year plan. And you might rotate your crops such as by uh, growing season or by your plant families. And we'll talk about plant families a little bit, but different plant families are susceptible to different kinds of diseases and pests. So for example, uh, the nightshades, our tomatoes and peppers and eggplants and potatoes are going to have uh, susceptibility to the same kinds of pests and diseases. So you're not going to want to plant them in the same plot every year. Or you could, but you might just have to take alternative um, steps to prevent pest and disease damage. Um, you might also consider planting your taller crops to the north of the garden bed to reduce the chances that they're going to shade out the shorter crops in, uh, towards the south. I should also mention that ideally your garden location would be to the south of your property because that's where it's going to get the most sun. Um, and you might also consider grouping perennials because those crops will not be rotated because they're going to be um, in the same place because they're perennials. So things like rhubarb or asparagus would have one plot continuously for the remainder of their plant life. Um, and if you're composting, you're going to want to consider your compost location. And that's based on convenience and also um, based on your zoning, your different city and county zoning ordinances might be different for your compost location, such as in my location, I have to have my compost at the back of my property, at the far end of my property. So that's important to know before you uh, put a compost in. 
there are some other needs and considerations that you should uh, consider before starting the garden, such as fertilizer and composting. Um, are you going to use fertilizer? Are you going to use compost? Are you going to use organic fertilizer? Are you um, going to use synthetic or traditional conventional fertilizer? Uh, what tools are you going to need? Do you need on-site tool storage? For example, if you're working with a community garden, you might not be able to store the tools in a building. You might need a tool shed. Um, if you're working with vertical space, you could be using trellises or other support system for your garden, which is a great way to use a small amount of space and really make the most of your space. Um, also being able to consider uh, being able to be out at the garden and watering on a regular basis and also making observations on a regular basis uh, so that you can prevent things like pests and diseases and weeds from taking over. You might also consider uh, your pest management program. So every gardener should be thinking about having a pest management program, uh, especially after your first year. <laughs> um, you'll start to get an understanding of what kinds of pests and diseases and weed problems you have in your area, or just by talking with other gardeners or your county extension educator, which I would be the county educator for Lake County. Um, we can give you kind of an understanding of what kinds of pests and diseases and weeds to look out for for different crops. Um, an integrated pest management is a big fancy term that Purdue uses that pretty much means uh, pest and disease prevention. So we're taking care of things um, using the environment, using their natural biology to prevent having to use things like pesticides and uh, herbicides and insecticides. But then if we do have to use those things, we're using them uh, and they're the best way that we can and the safest way that we can. Uh, so some things that you can do to prevent pest and disease uh, and weed inf infestation in your garden would be to mulch your garden um, using straw or landscape fabric or compost. And so that will reduce, reduce the chances of water spreading disease by splashing uh, disease from the soil back onto your plants. Um, also selecting your plants and your seeds for disease resistance. Um, choosing a location that is going to not have flooding um, and also to get enough sun. And then also being able to be out in the garden regularly to make observations, to check for diseases and pests and weeds before they become a really big problem. And also having an understanding of how much damage you're willing to tolerate because um, I would say no garden system is perfect. We're all going to have pests, some pests, diseases and weeds. So just having an understanding of how much of that you're willing to tolerate. So if you have um, you know, 10 lettuce plants, but you're willing to sacrifice two or three of them to the local rabbits or insects, then having an understanding that that's okay. And when do you plan to take action if needed? I highlight this resource, the midwestvegetableguide.org, so it's mwvegguide.org. Um, and it's, it's mostly intended for commercial vegetable growers, but it's great for gardeners as well. Uh, if you go to this website, you can choose what crop you're working with, also choose your pest, and it gives you a wide variety of different ways to treat that pest or disease infection um, using different varieties of control methods. So uh, biological, environmental, and then also talking about pesticides. So I mentioned if you're planning your garden and you're doing crop rotation, you might plant uh, your, your beds and rotate your crops based on families. And that can be because different families have different pest and disease issues in common. So for example, the brassicas or coal crops uh, like cauliflower, cabbage, radishes, broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, they have a lot of the same pest and disease issues. I know in our area, we, we run into a lot of caterpillar issues. <laughs> so that's something to watch out for and prevent ahead of time before it happens. Um, our Fabaceae family or our beans and legumes, uh, that's our peas and beans, <clears throat> those crops will add nitrogen back into your soil. So that's something to think about. If you have a crop that uses a lot of nitrogen, maybe you want to plant beans the year before so that it, the soil is prepared for them. Um, I mentioned our nightshades are also called Solanaceae. That includes tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, um, also potatoes. We also have cucurbits or, or cucurbitaceae, <laughs> and it's, it's kind of like what it sounds. It, it includes cucumbers, but also squash, 
uh, and melons. Continuing with plant families, there's some plant families that, um, at least on my account, were a little less known. Uh, so we have our asters, our asteraceae, but it includes things like lettuce, sunflowers, uh, zinnias, they're all in the same family. Uh, our amaranths, our amaranthaceae, includes things like spinach, beets, Swiss chard, and then our apiaceae or our umbels, our carrots, parsley, cilantro, among other things. And because to me, these crops are a little bit, um, I'm less likely <laughs> as an individual gardener to plant all of these crops. I'll usually just combine these families into one bed in my garden. So I'll have my lettuce, spinach, sunflowers, and carrots all in one bed. Um, and that's good enough for me. But for you, maybe you really, really like um, aster ACA. And so you have to have a separate family, just a separate bed just for asters and a separate bed for amaranth. So um, definitely based on the individual gardener preference. I mentioned you might want to plan around companion planting as well. And like the word sounds, companion planting um, are different crops that do well together. So they work best together for different reasons. Um, maybe uh, one crop introduces a nutrient into the soil that another crop finds beneficial. For example, um, beans or, or the Fabiaceae, Fabiaceae family <laughs> will introduce nitrogen into the soil. So you might plant that. Um, if you think about corn and soy farmers, they'll plant, they'll rotate their corn and their soy because soy will introduce nitrogen and corn needs a lot of nitrogen to be successful. Uh, trap cropping is another type of companion planting where you might plant a desirable crop uh, with an undesirable crop or a crop that you don't really care for that has the same uh, disease or pest issues. And so you're using the less desirable crop to draw the pests away from your desirable crop. So that's trap cropping. It's kind of like you're luring the plant, the, the pests away. So for example, if I really like collard greens and I don't really care for cabbage, maybe I plant the collard greens where I want them to be. And then I plant the cabbage a little ways away from the garden. So I'm hoping that the pests will go to the cabbage. Maybe the cabbage is a little more accessible and a little less protected. And so the pests are gonna be thinking that's easier to get to. So I'll go to that instead. Um, you might also have spatial benefits with companion plants. For example, um, one crop might provide shade for another crop um, or a vining crop might be able to use a taller crop to climb up it or it might um, spread out across the soil and act as a natural mulch reducing weed germination. Um, in this picture that I show on the left it's kind of a picture of the three sisters so we have corn and bean and squash and we also have uh, sunflowers here additionally but we would plant the corn first and then the beans and the squash and the sunflowers and then the beans would crawl and vine up the, up the corn stalks. And so the beans are benefiting from the corn uh, because they're able to use it for vertical growth, getting more sunlight. But the beans, like we mentioned, are then putting beneficial nitrogen into the soil that the corn needs to survive. And then the squash is beneficial because it's, it's shading out the ground. So then uh, less weed germination happens. And the the sunflower is beneficial because it's attracting beneficial insects, which we need to mention that not all insects are bad. Most of the insects in our garden are actually beneficial like our pollinators. Um, I mentioned different, uh, different seasonal crops. So we have our cool season and our warm season crops. A lot of people automatically think that um, a lot of gardeners are used to growing at one time a year. So maybe there's a rule that <laughs> I've heard a rule at least that everybody grows starting around Mother's Day. So in May, everybody's starting their garden. But did you know that in a lot of places um, in Indiana, at least you can actually start much earlier. So for example, I'm starting my cool season crops indoors with indoor seeds starting already. Um, and I plan to plant my outdoor, plant them outdoors for the cool season crops uh, later in March. So they're actually getting um, a quick start. So this is actually from a publication, uh, the Indiana Vegetable Planting Calendar, which is a Purdue publication. Um, and this has different um, cool season and warm season crops listed based on their cool hardiness and when you would plant them. 
So things like broccoli, radish, cabbage, collard greens, and even peas can be planted as early as four to six weeks before the last spring frost. So that's pretty early. Next, you might want to consider a planting calendar. And again, this can be as high tech or low tech as you'd like. You can have a separate calendar that you dedicate just to your planting calendar. I know I get a lot of freebie calendars in the mail, <laughs> or maybe you have a, a planner that you can use, or maybe you just use your phone like I do. Um, and so you want, you're going to want to plan out your garden season from start to finish. You're going to want to plan when you want to uh, purchase your seeds, when you want to start your seeds, if you're starting your seeds indoors or even outdoors, if you have a system in place where you can start your seeds outdoors, um, when you want to condition your plants, because we don't want to take a plant that's going to be uh, babied by grow being grown indoors all its life, all it, all it knows is being indoors with no uh, no actual sunlight, no <laughs> harsh weather conditions, and just putting it in the garden right away, it's not going to do very well. So you want to be able to give it a few days to a week to slowly condition it to the outdoor climate. Um, so then you're going to want to know when you plan to transplant those plants in the garden, uh, when you plan to direct seed the plants that you are direct seeding in the garden, when you plan to harvest, which is especially important because we spend all this time and put all of these, this energy and these resources into our garden. We don't wanna be gone on vacation when most of our harvest is ready. Or maybe we set up with a friend or a neighbor that can come and harvest for us. Um, yeah, so the whole thing from start to finish, from seed starting to harvest and even a second, uh, planting season. So that's something else is you can extend your grow season even further by having a summer planting for a fall harvest. So you plant essentially everything over again. <laughs> um, at least your cool season crops, you can do that because then they'll be, they'll be ready again for a fall harvest. So we'll talk about seed selection because like I, this is like the motto of the, <laughs> of the night, I guess, is it can be as easy or as complicated as you want it to be. Um, you can just go to your garden center or even some big box stores and get, um, just pick out seeds when you're ready to grow. Or you can um, get in on the, the planning wagon and start planning your garden as early as, you know, the end of the grow season the previous year and start purchasing your seeds for the next grow season, which is a great way to make sure you get all the interesting varieties that you want if you want to try new things or if you're looking specifically for hybrid or um, organic or heirloom varieties or specifically disease resistant varieties of different things. Um, you can do mail order or online catalogs. I have a couple years listed here. I don't specifically promote these two businesses that I've listed, but I just have them because I have experience with them and their, uh, the urban farmer seeds is more for vegetables and it's Indiana based and the Prairie Moon seeds is Midwest and it's more like native plants. Um, but I think they have a little bit of everything. Um, also, the All American Seed Selections or AAS accreditation, accreditation um, or the National Garden Bureau websites that I have listed here have examples of seed companies from all over the US that have been tried and true um, and scientific evidence shows that they do well across the US in the zones that they report. So <clears throat> if you go, I have a picture of the AAS <laughs> website here in the bottom right. And all of these seed companies are uh, vouched for by the AAS accreditation. So you can go on there and know that those seeds are going to do well in your area. I mentioned hybrid or heirloom, <laughs> um, which are also known as open pollinated. A lot of you have probably heard heirloom tomatoes. Those are very, very popular, but what does it mean? Um, so heirloom plants or open pollinated plants are true to type. So they're open pollinated, they're pollinated by pollinators often. Um, and so they're not intentionally bred or crossbred for specific traits. We know exactly what we're going to get because the offspring of that heirloom plant is going to be exactly like the parent. So we know this, the intended size, shape, color, flavor. Um, however, it's going to have less disease resistance. Um, 
because it has less genetic diversity than, for example, a hybrid plant, which is an intentional cross. So horticulturists came and intentionally crossed those plants, those parent plants to get an offspring, um, usually for increased disease resistance, but potentially also for different colors or flavors. However, um, despite having increased disease resistance, you might not know exactly what the offspring plant is going to get. So that's just an overview. <laughs> and if you go into an online seed catalog, you're going to see examples of hybrid and heirloom plants. And neither is better than the other. It's just based on their gardener preference. I want to just quickly mention seed saving because um, once you get into gardening, um, or maybe other people really want you to get into gardening and <laughs> they keep giving you lots of seed packets, you might have seed packets accumulate year and year and year after year. And so how long can you keep those seed packets? Well, you could keep them indefinitely, but their germination, um, success does go down typically after two years. Um, I have listed here some estimates of kind of best buy dates recommended for different plant seeds, but ideally use your seeds up in two years. Um, I also want to talk about seed spacing because it can be really exciting when you're purchasing seeds and you want to buy several packets of different varieties and uh, try different kinds. Maybe you want to try five or six different kinds of tomatoes, but maybe you don't have that much space in your garden. So it's good to know how much space different plants take up. And you can find this information online or on the back of different seed packets. I have listed here on the uh, on the right, a back of a seed packet. It'll give you pretty much all the information you need to know about seed spacing, uh, seed planting depth, things like that. Um, but then I also have listed here on the left, it's actually a snippet from a junior master gardener activity on paper towel gardening, which is really fun for kids and adults. Um, <laughs> but it, I just like it because it gives an, a, a great example of how many seeds you would put on a paper towel um, so if you know a typical like square foot paper towel, it's essentially square foot gardening. So you're picturing how many seeds you can put in a square foot. That should help you plan your garden. And if you want to actually do paper towel gardening, that's fun too. Now I'd like to talk about seed starting and transplanting. So um, this is not as complicated as, uh, as some beginning gardeners might think. Anybody can seed start and then transplant. You really just need um, containers <laughs> to put your seeds in and you need a nice sunny, ideally south facing window. Or you can find really inexpensive mini greenhouses, even at places like Aldi <laughs> or online. Um, you can find these mini greenhouses for like 20, 30, 40 bucks. Um, to put in your house. Uh, you don't need grow lights, although um, you can find those at, at garden centers and they will um, give, your, give your seedlings an edge and help them grow straight. Um, it, starting seeds indoors um, could save you money if you're a person that will traditionally go and purchase seed starts or purchase plant starts from a garden center. For example, a lot of people will purchase seeds, plant starts of tomatoes <laughs> and peppers from garden centers. And so those can run for a few dollars a piece. Whereas if you're starting your seeds at home uh, to transplant, you're only spending you know, a few dollars for a flat of seeds um, once you get your startup costs. Um, and this is a great way to extend the growing season because you're essentially planting the plant. So you're planting like a, a young plant, a seedling uh, in the ground in the garden when you would normally be planting a seed because that plant is hardy to be outdoors at that time of the season, whether it's a seed or a seedling. And so if you're starting as a seedling, you're giving it a few weeks of a head start so your harvest will be ready sooner. So I mentioned you just need containers. You could get these uh, seed starting cells and seed starting trays you can find at garden centers or online, or you can just use any containers that are at least four inches deep. So I've seen people use like solo cups or other plastic cups. Um, and then as I mentioned, you're going to want to condition them outside be slowly before you plant them outdoors. So just slowly starting to put them outdoors for longer and longer, getting them more and more sunlight. So you're going to want to start with like an hour a day in the shade and slowly move up from there. 
and you can officially transplant them in the garden when it's appropriate to do so temperature wise. Um, and also once they have their first set of true leaves because all the seedlings are started with their um, cotyledons, which are those baby leaves and they don't really do much for photosynthesis. They're just a source of energy for the seed. <clears throat> But not all plants are suitable for transplant. This is just a list of some of them. Um, what I tend to think of is any plant that's going to take a longer time to grow, but is not a root crop <laughs> would be potentially worth starting indoors. So I start pretty much everything except for um, lettuces for cool season crops. And I just, I wouldn't start any roots because they're difficult to um, transplant and I wouldn't start lettuces or spinach or anything like that because it's just not worth the time. They have such a quick growth rate that you might as well just start them directly outdoors than indoors. Um, <clears throat> but the best suited plants for transplant have efficient water absorption and form new, new roots easily and can be held and manip like handled <laughs> without breaking and falling apart. Um, and this is just a table um, that shows the amount of time that it takes plants to grow before they are uh, transplanted. So usually I estimate around a month to a month and a half on average because this is a lot of different numbers and I just like to be average <laughs> and lazy. So um, you can do what you want, but <laughs> taking an average works for me. <clears throat> <laughs> so if you go to a garden center to purchase your, your seed, your seedlings or your plant starts, um, it can be tempting to get the seedling that's tall and maybe even has some flowers and maybe some fruits on it. But actually, you're going to want to choose this guy. You're going to choose the short, stocky uh, seedling with lots of leaves no flowers and no fruit because you know that plant is putting all of its energy into its foliage and its um, roots, its root stock. So it's going to have a nice healthy root stock. And if it's not tall and gangly like the one next to it is, you know that it wasn't planted too close together because that's what happens <laughs> is if the seedlings in a tray are planted too close together, they don't have enough room to spread out um, and maybe they don't have enough sunlight. So that's why they're gonna grow tall and gangly to get to the light. So now you're ready to grow <laughs> after all that. So you're gonna to wanna to work your soil if you're growing in ground, which is one option to grow outdoors. Maybe you're not growing in ground, we'll talk about that. Um, but if you're growing in the ground, you're, wanna, you're gonna to wanna to prepare your site first. Well, before you do anything, you're gonna to wanna to call 811 to find out where your utility lines are because you're not going to want to <laughs> plant anywhere near there. Um, and there are different methods to prepare your site. This is this is considering you're starting with lawn or starting with something that was not a garden before. And so you can use a tiller, which you can purchase or you can rent um, from your local garden center. Um, you might just use a spade or another no-till method would be uh, using just a broad fork after you kill the grass and you can kill the grass either using an herbicide, which so if, if you're not concerned, um, if you are someone who's okay with using herbicides, then you can use herbicides safely um, for the purpose of killing the grass. And then it'll tell you on the label when it's safe to replant something and it, it won't harm your plants. <clears throat> or you can kill the grass by pretty much just suffocating it and not letting any light get to the grass. So on the picture on the far left here, we have an example of a pollinator garden that was being put into place in Hobart. Um, this, this one's actually outside the UU at Hobart in Hobart. And so there's landscape fabric along the edges and there's cardboard and then there's mulch. <laughs> and so there's a lot of layers there, but it's, you could just use cardboard and that cardboard is with, weighed down with something. Um, and that's going to kill the grass usually over a few weeks to a month or so. Um, and then you can use a broad fork to just kind of loosen up the soil without tilling it. And so then once you have your soil exposed, um, the way that you can know if it's ready to work um, without disturbing the, 
um, the soil itself because we don't want to work with soil when it's not ready to work because then we can actually disturb and um, mess with the composition of the soil and it can lead to issues down the line with erosion and things like that. So you want to work with the soil when it's nice and fluffy, um, such as the picture on the left. If it's too wet, it's going to form dirt clods easily and we don't want that. We want to let it dry out before we work with that. If you're growing in the ground, so not like a container, you might also consider doing a soil test. Um, and I was gonna play a video, but we're not going to just for the sake of time. There are lots of videos on the Purdue Extension YouTube page on how to conduct a soil test or your local county educator, such as myself, can uh, talk with you about conducting a soil test. And that's ideal before you do anything <laughs> as far as, um, planting or nutrient adding nutrients, even compost into your soil, because you need to know the pH and what nutrients are already there before you introduce anything else. So I have uh, an example soil test report from the lab that we use in Lake County, uh, in the Lake County Extension Office here on the right. And so it tells you um, all the information that you need to know before you make any, any adjustments. Um, for example, in Lake County, we find a lot of heavy clay soil. So, uh, and we also have um, a higher pH, so more alkaline soil in a lot of places. So you wouldn't want to add anything that's going to um, raise the pH more. Are there any questions at this time? Jennifer has a question. Yeah. If growing seeds indoors, what combination of dirt is needed to provide the seeds with enough nutrition to grow? She's aware oh, there are bags of seed starting dirt, but what else can be used when mixing it yourself? Oh, that is a great question. Um, there's actually a great publication that I'd be happy, I'm making a note to myself to like send out to the group, um, which is great to use for um, any, anything in a pot, anything in a container, and you can also use it for seed starting. Um, it used to be kind of that you're supposed to really just use the seed starting mix, but it, it seems like a lot of potting soil these days have similar nutrients. Um, so you can use those as well. You're definitely not going to want to just scoop soil out of your yard <laughs> and use that. Um, so either a store bought seed starting mix, potting soil, or I'll share a resource on how you can make your own container potting soil mix. Okay, so that um, last segment was talking about gardening in the ground, right? So now we're gonna talk about gardening still outdoors, but in containers. For example, raised beds, which are essentially really large containers. Um, so there are different reasons you might use a raised bed or container instead of growing in the ground. It might be because your soil isn't ideal, or maybe you don't even have workable soil on the site. Maybe you have a concrete lot, but you still want a garden. And so a raised bed is a great way to work around that. Or you could have ideal soil that uh, you could still use or even mix with the raised bed method, but maybe you wanna raise your garden up to a higher level, either for accessibility or to use as a teaching tool. Um, for example, you see this picture of some teachers with some students. Uh, you can actually install benches pretty easily onto your raised beds. And that's a great place for your students to sit while you're teaching in the garden. Um, you are definitely going to need some more materials <laughs> for working in a raised bed than you would in an in-ground garden. So some things you're going to need I have listed here. And we also have a traditional design that we recommend that I'd be happy to talk more about with anybody interested in installing raised beds. We typically don't recommend them to be more than four feet wide if you have access to both sides of a raised bed. Or if you only have access to one side, like if it's up against something, uh, you want it to be no more than about two feet wide. So you're going to have access to reach over the whole thing. You're going to want it to be at least 12 inches high uh, so that you can get the appropriate depth of soil for your crops, especially root, root crops. But it can be as long as you want. <laughs> Once you have the beds built, you can either have the beds um, just kind of shimmied into the ground, <laughs> a nice uh, flat surface, or you can have posts. Like you see the ones on the top left do have posts. And so that not only holds your bed together, um, but it also, you can um, 
put those posts in the ground and really help that bed stay secure, then you're going to want to use, uh, well, it depends. If you're going to use the soil that's already there, you don't have to really do anything besides make sure that the grass is removed. But if you're not wanting to use the soil that's there on site, you're going to want to line it with something like landscape fabric, or you can use cardboard, cardboard and landscape fabric to separate your soil that you're bringing in from the garden soil that's already there. And then you're going to want to uh, add in some sort of organic matter, um, such as leaves or compost. And so that would be if you're not getting a garden mix. And so there are different places that you can purchase soil from. You can get soil in bulk just by Googling bulk soil near me <laughs> or uh, going to your local garden centers. Um, and this actually shows a way to calculate how much soil you're going to need. So this is from gardeners.com, but there are a lot of online soil calculators. Sometimes garden centers, online stores will even have soil calculators. So you can estimate how much soil you're going to need. Sometimes places will have just topsoil. And in that case, you're going to want to add that organic matter such as compost, um, dried leaves, uh, perlite, vermiculite, sand. Um, there's uh, a homemade mix. Actually, this is what we were talking about a little bit ago um, <laughs> with Jennifer's question. So this is from a publication that I'll send out to you guys as well. Um, so it recommends one third topsoil, one third vermiculite or perlite, and one third compost or some other organic matter, ideally. Um, and that's so that you're going to have good drainage good nutrients in your soil, and also you're going to ret retain moisture. So it's that balance of retaining moisture, but also having good drainage um, for good soil composition. Because if it's just topsoil, it's going to get compacted. And after that first year, you're going to really regret it <laughs> because it's going to just get really hard and crusty. Um, you can use to uh, topsoil and compost alone, but it's not ideal. It's good to have those other mixtures. Sometimes garden centers will have a garden mix that they maybe charge a little bit more for than plain old, plain old topsoil. And it will be topsoil, compost, and usually like a sand, um, which is a cheaper option for having good drainage. Um, there are also some other container gardening options. Some of you might use planters or repurpose containers I've seen use tire containers being used, um, old wheelbarrows, you know, as long as you um, are being safe with that and have some sort of liner, you are typically a-okay. You just want to follow the guidelines of having at least six inches for depth or more if you're working with a root crop. I have over here from another Purdue publication, uh, the suggested minimum container size. And so this is actually diameter. Um, so you're also going to want to think about your diameter because different plants take up different amounts of space. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you have drainage holes uh, and you're going to want to maybe as a tip have something light at the bottom of a deep container. So for example, we used five gallon bucket gardens <laughs> for one of our garden projects last year where we were giving uh, buckets to first time moms through a center and they it was great, except that the buckets were very heavy and we didn't need the whole five gallons of soil. Um, so someone had made a suggestion that we put clean, recycled uh, plastic water bottles on the bottom. So then you still have the amount of soil that you need for the roots and the roots can still continue to grow through that, the spaces in the water bottles, even without the soil. Um, but it's a lot lighter, like half the weight. So that's something to keep in mind if you're using a really deep container, you don't really need it to be more than 10 to 12 inches in depth um, or six inches if you're really working with anything except root vegetables. Um, you're gonna wanna keep in mind uh, that container gardens do need to be watered more than in-ground gardens. Uh, they still need the six hours of sunlight. Um, and you can plant them earlier because the soil is actually going to warm up quicker in a container or a raised bed compared to the, the ground garden. So you can plant them even earlier. So 
you know, the early March <laughs> gardening. Um, and then as an added benefit, if your containers are small enough, you can bring the gardens indoors if you end up with a surprise frost or a surprised snow late in, late in the spring season. Uh, it's also important to note that you should only use chemicals like pesticides and fertilizers that are labeled for container use. So always read the label before you purchase or use any chemicals. Um, and understand what it's supposed to be used for. So what crop, it'll list what crop it's supposed to be used for at what rates and if it's ideal for containers or not. And also still monitor for pest diseases and weeds because those still happen in containers. Uh, I'd also like to share some examples of different outdoor gardening methods that I haven't mentioned yet. So these are some pictures. The two on the left of, of these pictures are from Gabus Arboretum, Purdue Northwest in Valpo. Um, and we have a tower garden and you might also consider pallet gardens or a wall garden or climbing garden. So you can get really creative with your vertical space in your containers. Um, the picture on the right is actually of a pallet compost. So that's another option as well. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your time and invite you to follow Purdue Extension Lake County or your own county <laughs> extension if you're not from Lake County on social media and also online at our website. And I'll take any further questions that people have. Sandra would like to know what mixture of soil should be used in a sandy area? Um, yes, would that be for an in-ground site, I'm assuming, an in-ground garden? I would assume so, yes. <laughs> yeah, so you can definitely plant in a sandy site, sometimes without any additions. Um, I'd, be, I'd be happy to talk with um, this person individually about your garden needs. I would definitely recommend <clears throat> um, having a soil test done for any in-ground garden because your sandy sites are going to have different needs than your, um, your clay site. You should be able to grow the same vegetable crops except that you might have to water it more often and you might have to apply your fertilizers and your other nutrients uh, more often because it's going to have a better drainage than a, <clears throat> a clay site. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. So pros and cons, high sandy soil, um, you're going to have great drainage so you don't have to worry about flooding, <laughs> but you're going to have to water it more often, add more nutrients more often because it's going to just leach out really easy versus a clay site, you don't have to water it maybe as much and it holds on to nutrients, but you have a higher chance of flooding and having heavily compacted soils. Great question. Does soil need to be augmented on year two of a raised bed? That's a great question too. Um, yeah. So I know I mentioned like soil tests all the way for in-ground gardening, but after that first year for a raised bed, um, you may consider doing a soil test as well because it's really hard to make any recommendations um, without knowing what's already there. But if you know you haven't added anything to it since its original state, then it is likely you're going to at least want to add some nitrogen, um, whether in the form of adding some compost or whatever your intended source of nitrogen is. We have some publications available um, that tells you uh, your ideal nutrient management plans for like container gardening or in-ground gardening. And uh, you wanna be adding that supplemental nitrogen in particular at different stages throughout the growing, the growing process. So I would say that that at least I would, I would think to add either compost or another form of nitrogen. Can you add cow manure directly? I would not recommend that unless it's been composted already. So um, you, some farms will add manure directly, but only if they know that they're not going to be harvesting anytime soon. There's uh, for produce safety, I don't wanna say any particular number of days, but I, it's, definitely different if you're using like raw manure versus, co versus composted manure by like half the time or something. So if you're using raw manure, you could incorporate it directly, but 
um, I would do it maybe at the end of the grow season the year before. And so then it's going to have time to break down and um, any weird <laughs> diseases or anything that's in there is going to have time to break down before you grow the next season. So yes, but safely. Okay, next question. Jennifer would like to know if the fabric liner decomposes inside of the raised beds. Mm, I have seen it um, over time, especially if it's not applied correctly. So you definitely, you want to, when you first put it in, make sure that it's tight enough that it's where you want it, but not so tight that it's going to be stretching and breaking because you can like, you can tear it with the landscape fabric. So you kind of want to have it like a fitted sheet almost like so it, it's taut but not too taut and that'll help keep it um the longest over time um but it, it would be several years before it breaks down um yeah i would i should probably do some research on what to do after that <laughs> a lot of people use landscape fabric and um it seems to be good for several years, but yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some research to see if I can find anything about like after after a while. Great question. Okay, Joyce has something on the chat. She says I've tried every year to grow cucumbers in five gallon buckets. They start out like wildfire and give me cucumbers, but before long the veins the vines shrivel and die overnight. What am I doing wrong? Hmm. I'm looking back over here because I'm trying to picture a five gallon container, depending on the diameter, it might have something to do with it if it doesn't have enough space to spread out because cucumber cucumbers like others in the cucurbit family like to be able to spread out. Um, it might be a disease issue. So I'd be happy to talk with you individually about what you're seeing and your in your plant. All right, next question is from Cassie. Can I plant a garden near wetlands? And if so, what types of plants would work best? Ooh, I have not gotten this question before. Um, the only thing I would worry about is, so I'm thinking like vegetables and I mean, you would ideally want good drainage, which you typically don't see near a wetland. Um, I think certain plants do well in wetter areas or um, I think watermelons are one, <laughs> um, but there, there are other plants that aren't vegetables. Like you could plant like a, like a riparian wetland garden, um, with plants that do well. And I'd be happy to send specific resources to, to you about that. If you want to reach out to me. Okay. The next question is from Laura. She lives in South Bend and she's having problems getting squash pollinated. Any suggested annuals that would work? Yeah, yeah, so that definitely happens. Um, I've heard of some people will hand pollinate squash. Um, I believe marigolds are one that you can use to attract beneficial pollinators to squash. Um, <clears throat> Having a pollinator garden close to a vegetable garden in general is really beneficial. Um, sometimes what will happen with squash and others in the cucurbit family, they will put out, well, this, this typically happens, is they'll put out male flowers first um, to attract the pollinators. And so those are like the really long skinny, the flowers on the long skinny stalks. And then they'll put out the female flowers later after the pollinators have been attracted. And so then you need both kinds of flowers. And so that's important to see is that you're getting both kinds of flowers eventually at the same time. <laughs> um, but attracting beneficial pollinators either with um, just a companion plant like marigolds uh, or maybe zinnias, um, or you can have just a pollinator garden close by. Anything that attracts pollinators would then attract them to your, to your vegetables as well. Rebecca, I think that's it for questions. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone.